Ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha. Recently, I posted a fairly disparaging thread on Twitter regarding Upper Echelon Gaming and one of his recent videos discussing loot boxes within the industry and the proposed bill to ban loot boxes and pay-to-win microtransactions in games marketed to children. Upper Echelon Gaming did respond, and we had a lengthy discourse that, while it was mostly cordial, we ended things as it was rather unproductive, and I wasn't getting my points across at all well. I will freely and openly admit that I did not comport myself well during that interaction. My arguments were poorly formulated, I somehow directly contradicted myself through poor phrasing multiple times, and I left myself in a position where my overall statements could be picked apart with ease, which he did so in a response video to that Twitter interaction. Now, Upper Echelon Gaming states that he released that video due to my expressed desire to take part in the upcoming FTC workshops surrounding loot boxes and the discussion as to whether or not they are gambling, stating that this would be good practice for me as I did not handle myself at all well during our interaction and that during that workshop, I would likely be facing far more competent opposition than him. Upper Echelon Gaming is no fool. He is an intelligent person, and he has formulated his arguments extremely well, whereas I did not. Now, I fully admit fault on that score, and I did publicly apologize for my initial expression on Twitter being more vitriolic than it should have been. Essentially, I casually tossed a glove across the room while sipping wine, and he picked up that glove, snatched the wine goblet out of my hand, tossed it to the floor, and then smacked me across the face with my own glove. I deserved it, I won't deny. I also don't deny that I do need practice. More often than not, I'm faced with opponents that are nowhere near as capable as Upper Echelon, and if I do want to adequately represent gaming against loot boxes with the FTC, I'd best step up my game. And his response video is extremely well done. He continued to argue his points very well, and while he did take a couple of carefully crafted digs at me directly, they were well-deserved digs, especially considering how incompetently I handled that exchange between us. So without the limitations of text and with the ability to show context, let's try this again. I'm sure it is a possibility that he will release a follow-up video to this one, and he's welcome to if he so decides. I doubt that I'll keep this going beyond this video, however. I hold no interest in turning this into a video format back and forth, and I doubt he does either. Quite simply, our duty is to you, the viewer, and I doubt anyone would benefit from letting this devolve into drama nonsense. That said, I do not know Upper Echelon Gaming very well, but after that interchange, I will be paying a bit closer attention to his channel. Like I said, he's no fool. He's highly intelligent and motivated and bears keeping an eye on. I certainly won't shy away from being called out on my shit just as he is fully within his right to pick me apart over those interactions. I doubt I would have done any less were the roles reversed. I'm saying that and repeating that because I want it made clear that I hold no animosity towards him whatsoever, nor do I think he is bad at what he does. He has treated me with as much respect as someone in his position could be expected to muster, and he is deserving of being afforded every courtesy in return. Now, I will, of course, be linking both of his videos in the description below for all of you to be able to go view them in their entirety should you so choose. However, as it would seem that I did not equate myself well on Twitter, let's start fresh and see if I can form a cohesive position off of what was an easily and rightfully picked apart standing on Twitter. Now, first of all, I do agree with Upper Echelon that loot boxes are a terrible thing and they should not exist. I also fully agree with him that legislation within the U.S. is a labyrinthian nightmare of the highest order and the likelihood of any bill surviving the process is exceedingly slim. I also concur that the Hawaii legislation posed by Chris Lee did die, because that's the facts, it's the truth. And I myself suspect that Chris Lee simply let them die, as they either weren't going to go anywhere to begin with, or because they served their political purpose. That is, of course, merely my theory in that, and I have no evidence to support that line of reasoning. It just seems to fit from my standing. But let's talk through some specifics. In my poorly worded, barely coherent rambling on Twitter, I asserted that Upper Echelon heavily implied that these companies rely on loot boxes not only for profits, but for survival. Well, let's run through some clips from his video to show what I was referring to. At that time, I discussed how loot box revenue, particularly within FIFA, was a core section of the earnings roster for EA as a publisher, and how if this newfound legislation were to sweep across Europe, it would spell disaster for the industry titan. Another area to really think about is economic ramifications. EA is just one company reliant on loot boxes, and believe me, they rely on them. I've heard people bitch and whine about how they shouldn't and didn't used to, so why should they now, with the expectation that if loot boxes were to be banned, nothing would happen? And that's mostly true, the first parts at least. They didn't in the past, and they certainly shouldn't now either, but the stone-cold truth is that they do, and there will be huge ramifications if they were to be banned. 
In 2016, FIFA as an entire franchise accounted for roughly 40% of EA's revenue, but keep in mind games like Apex Legends exist now as well, which rely fully on microtransactions since it is a free-to-play game. The in-game purchases for FIFA account for nearly 800 million in revenue annually, and among the list of countries in which Ultimate Team is available, the United States is second when it comes to overall revenue within the gaming market. It is a reasonable extrapolation that the US is by far the largest relevant gaming market for AAA video game consumption and loot box sales in the entire world. EA is also a California-based publisher that operates out of Redwood City, and in total employs over 9,000 people. EA and all companies like it have a fiduciary responsibility to increase profits year over year for their shareholders. When Bungie took Destiny and split from Activision Blizzard, an investigation started as a result of the sudden and massive decline which was aimed at finding insider trading or exposing other instances of non-compliance. Activision Blizzard is another California-based company operating out of Santa Monica and employs about, give or take, 9,000 people. Now, as I said before, I could be reading too much into this, and while Upper Echelon does maintain an anti-loot box stance, that does seem to paint a doom and gloom picture, at least peripherally focused on the number of potential jobs lost where loot boxes and pay-to-win mechanics to be banned. Even an openly stated reticence to have loot boxes removed, at least with existing games, due to his fondness for them. But I also would not necessarily be happy, I would be nervous. A ban on loot boxes in essence is good because loot boxes are trash and shouldn't exist, but it would throw a wrench into a bunch of different franchises and games that I do love simply because they come from certain publishers. Also in his video he points to one other talking point that I think bears discussing. But if you simply compare the idea of time gating to other games, you can see that a game like Warframe actually has some similarities that a piece of legislation might not be able to differentiate between. In Warframe, items and frames have crafting times. Those crafting times can be skipped with premium currency called Platinum, thus allowing enough overlap for poorly designed regulation to prohibit the use of time gating and paired microtransaction sales, which would then effectively kill or at least severely handicap Warframe, which is a free-to-play game, but not really guilty of what any educated gamer would describe as predatory pay to win. Now, we do have to think about ramifications to a certain extent, I agree, at least in concept. If any of this is going to completely and utterly destroy the industry that we're trying to save, well, then that is an approach that would have to be abandoned now, wouldn't it? Now, one would think that would be a it-goes-without-saying moment. The only reason why we would even be so concerned with the industry that we would want to save it is because we care about the industry and we care about gaming. I think that is something that most of us can agree on without too much hesitation. None of us would wish to see the industry implode. But yes, there will be ramifications. There will be some of the good caught up along with the bad. That is an inevitable outcome. To think otherwise is to believe that there is some sort of perfect solution out there somewhere that someone just hasn't conceived of yet, but that isn't how the world works. There is no perfect solution, there's no perfect answer, no matter what direction is chosen, there is always someone undeserving caught up along with those that very much are. It's unfortunate, it's terrible, but it's also unavoidable. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't do our damnedest to mitigate that possibility. Absolutely, we should. I can say that without any sort of reservation at all. However, Upper Echelon has phrased those ramifications within this video based upon jobs and the interference with games that he enjoys. EA is also a California-based publisher that operates out of Redwood City, and in total employs over 9,000 people. Activision Blizzard is another California-based company operating out of Santa Monica and employs about, give or take, 9,000 people. But when people understand how catastrophic it would be for major publishers that thousands of people would lose their jobs, tens of thousands of others, more than that, much more than that, would lose massive amounts of money, hopefully it starts to make sense why the mere fact that a bill has been introduced means absolutely fuck all. But it would throw a wrench into a bunch of different franchises and games that I do love simply because they come from certain publishers. So yes, there will be ramifications, and large ones at that. However, I do maintain that this industry has come so far down the dark path of loot boxes and predatory methods of pushing microtransactions that those ramifications are ultimately unavoidable if we want to be able to correct this industry and get it onto a more pro-consumer path. Now, he does have a decent point about government regulation in general but relying on U.S. legislative bodies is irresponsible. Government regulation is like a bull in a china shop or a sledgehammer trying to fix a watch. Relying on U.S. legislative bodies is irresponsible. Yes, I think so to an extreme extent. The only difficulty here is there are only two other options possible. The first would be self-regulation, and I think we can all agree that simply will not happen, period, ever, end of story. The other is market pressure. 
Now, Upper Echelon also had this to say about government regulation. The same way we got to this point through gradual incremental steps forward is the same way we get back from it. I love video games. I want great games from quality companies, but throwing a stick of dynamite into the middle of all of it isn't the best approach. The best approach that he's referring to there is market pressure, but as I said, that's not the only possibility. Self-regulation, market pressure, government legislation, those are basically the only options on the table at this time. The only way the games industry will become self-regulated is if we have a similar situation with when the ESRB was formed over Mortal Kombat and other gory video games. The government basically said either you regulate yourselves or we will regulate you. Either way, you're getting regulated on this. And the ultimately ineffectual and toothless ESRB, an arm of the lobbyist IDSA that was later renamed the ESA, was formed in 1994. The other option is market pressure, like I said, forcing the industry to self-correct out of a desire for self-preservation. Upper Echelon even refers to the only example we have of this with Star Wars Battlefront 2 EA. But the real driving force behind Battlefront 2 getting reworked was the fan base. EA was about to destroy the future of a beloved and unbelievably profitable franchise, and the fans forced them to change up the approach. This is a direct assertion that if we keep doing the same thing with other games, then they will back off and adopt a more pro-consumer stance. And in theory, he is correct. However, the likelihood of that happening hovers somewhere slightly below Ryan Johnson putting out a good Star Wars movie or Electronic Arts winning a Consumer Advocacy Award. The Star Wars Battlefront 2 EA and the nearly unanimous outrage that followed the blatantly pay-to-win monetization was an anomaly within the games industry, and I think it highly unlikely that any other franchise out there would elicit the same level of response. The Star Wars hasn't been around for 40 years. It is not only a beloved franchise, it is one of the most beloved franchises in entertainment history. We all grew up with Star Wars in our lives in some form or another. Remember, though, that this same sort of thing with the pay-to-win monetization is taking place right now in EA sports games such as FIFA, and while EA has backed off on pay-to-win within their non-sports franchises for now, it is only for now. Upper Echelon himself pointed out the fact that these corporations not only desire but operate under a mandate of increased profits and profit potential year after year. EA and all companies like it have a fiduciary responsibility to increase profits year over year for their shareholders. As a result of the mandated requirement, we are all but assured that the industry will in no way self-regulate until they are pressured to do so, and we can also all but guarantee that outside of another franchise even remotely as popular as Star Wars being messed with, that scenario with Battlefront 2 EA is not likely to happen again anytime soon. Waiting for that is essentially waiting for lightning to strike twice. So no, government regulation is not the best option by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I think we can both agree that it is the worst possible option and outcome. But of the options available, it is the only one with even a remote possibility of even happening, but most likely not in the form that this bill will entail. That's true. Now, as I stated on Twitter, this is a proposal for a bill, not the bill itself. It does provide us with the briefest of outlines, but, and again, Upper Echelon and I both agree here, that the actual bill, if it even gets to that stage, will most likely bear little resemblance to even the proposal that the bill was based upon. And I also agree with him that the bill will most likely die the same way that Hawaii's did. He's correct that people rejoicing over the government regulation should hold their cheers. Remember, government regulation is and will continue to be the worst option there is. And that's even if it gets passed. Government regulation should remain the absolute last recourse possible. But unfortunately for consumers, government regulation to stem the tide of highly predatory business practices within this industry is really the only option left. Now, I'm not saying this bill is the last option, not by any stretch of the imagination. It is still possible that the FTC will rule that loot boxes themselves are a form of gambling and will be regulated as such. That is actually far more likely than this bill being passed would accomplish many of the same ends minus the portions relating to pay to win and is ultimately a far more reasonable methodology. But I also would not necessarily be happy... I would be nervous. A ban on loot boxes in essence is good because loot boxes are trash and shouldn't exist, but it would throw a wrench into a bunch of different franchises and games that I do love simply because they come from certain publishers. Yes, we do have to think about the ramifications. They must remain forefront in our minds so we can be absolutely certain that the fallout and the inevitable damage caused by such legislation is mitigated as much as reasonably possible. Because, make no mistake, there will be fallout. There will be jobs lost. There will be developers that find their games no longer viable through no fault of their own, excepting they check one too many boxes on the pay-to-win or loot box list. 
I feel terrible about that, as I'm sure many others do as well, but this is a situation where if the fallout is carefully weighed and measured, then that same fallout should not stay our hands. So did I have a bad take on Twitter? Dear God, abso fucking lootly. Did Upper Echelon do a good job with his video? I think so. His rebuttal was extremely well formulated, and it was a right-deserved verbal ass-kicking. He and I agree on much of these topics, but I think you'll now be able to see a little clearer that we disagree on just enough to be important. Upper Echelon did say something that I will thank him for here, though, that I do need the practice. I'm unaccustomed to debating really anything, and if I do wish to go to the FTC workshop, he's absolutely correct that I damn well better be prepared. Because if, and I have to stress that if, I do by some miracle end up going, I will be representing a large number of gamers and I'd best get myself prepared and quick. Thankfully though, I do have a bit of a reputation for learning from my mistakes and making sure I'm better prepared in the future, and I will be doing exactly that. Debate is an art that I'm not currently well suited, and he showed a massive chink in my proverbial armor. It is a vulnerability that I do need to remedy, so yeah, for that I do have to thank him. Now that said, I think that's where I'll leave off. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha, and I'll see you next time.